What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafty Workshop video and welcome to my bonus room. So this week's video is a first in a series that I'm going to be doing on projects in this room. But before I do any of those, I wanted to start with a clean slate with some brand new solid oak hardwood flooring. So I've installed a bunch of other types of flooring on this channel. In case you've missed those, I'll have a playlist of all my home improvement stuff above. But this was the first time I've ever done nail down hardwood flooring. And while it wasn't super challenging, it did have its own techniques and its own challenges that I ran into. So hopefully you guys enjoy this one and let's go ahead and get started with the video. Our bonus room had become what was basically a storage room since moving into our house back in February. This room hasn't had much of an identity since it wasn't really a bedroom and because it didn't really need it to be an office, so it kind of just became a dumping ground for stuff. So I decided that enough was enough and that I finally needed to revamp our bonus room. And I've got some big plans for some awesome built-in cabinetry, including two Murphy beds, a closet dresser combo, filing cabinet, and a desk, so stay tuned for those videos. But all that being said, I wanted to start the work in the bonus room by replacing the carpet with some hardwood flooring, since it would have been next to impossible to do that once all the cabinetry was in. I also wanted to replace all of the baseboards and window and door casings with more modern looking 1x4 and 1x6 trim, so I started by removing the existing trim after cleaning everything out of the room. So removing the trim was pretty simple, I just scored the caulk line with a utility knife and then used this tool called the trim puller to pry off the trim. And the key here is really to just avoid putting too much pressure on the drywall, as it's pretty easy to dent it or even punch right through, which I did in one spot. A little overzealous with the trim puller down here and punched through the drywall, so had to fix that. So once that trim was out, I could start removing the carpet, and I like to remove carpet in smaller sections so that it's easier to move around once it's pulled up. And I just cut the sections with the utility knife and then pulled up the carpet from the corners, which is where the carpet is attached to the tack strips. After removing the carpet, I came back and removed the carpet pad, which was attached with staples. And luckily, whoever installed this carpet didn't go nuts with the staples, and the pad actually typically leaves little chunks behind where it was stapled, which gave me a good visual reference of where the staples were located when it came time to remove them. Speaking of which, next I went ahead and removed all the staples, and I've found that diagonal pliers are just about the quickest way to remove these while making sure you've thoroughly removed all the staples. And again, I was super lucky in that the carpet installers only added staples around the perimeter of the room and along the seams of the carpet pad. Once the staples were up, I could work on removing the tack strips. I found that a pry bar removes these really quickly and the key is to just barely pry up each nail that fastens the tack strip to the subfloor. If you pry up too much, the tack strip will break into a bunch of pieces and will be a total mess to clean up. Also, be really careful when working around these tack strips, as they are insanely sharp and covered in pointy bits. I actually like to roll up the tack strips in the carpet pad after removing them, which makes them a lot easier to dispose of safely. Once the tack strips were up, all that was left to do was go around and check for any remaining staples I might have missed, as well as any raised subfloor nails. So when I came across these, I just pounded them back down with a hammer, and you could also add some deck screws to these areas for some reinforcement, or to any areas where you have any squeaking for a bit of extra hold, but my subfloor was pretty well attached and I didn't really need to do that. After that, I could just vacuum up any dust and debris to finish prepping the subfloor. And vacuuming also gives you one final chance to find any remaining staples, as the vacuum will usually get hung up on any raised bits. So with that, the subfloor was prepped and I could move on to installing a vapor barrier, which is a requirement when working with solid hardwood flooring. And a vapor barrier just helps to prevent too much moisture from contacting the flooring, which will cause rapid expansion and subsequently cupping. I used a plastic vapor barrier as this bonus room is above our unconditioned garage and will be exposed to more moisture because of that, but most flooring installers use something like red rosin paper or felt paper. This plastic vapor barrier had an adhesive strip built in so that I could attach the strips to each other rather than having to use a ton of staples to attach it to the flooring. I did start and end each row by stapling the vapor barrier to the subfloor using a hammer tacker and I made sure the vapor barrier extended across the entire subfloor and through the doorway transition. With the vapor barrier down, I could finally start getting the flooring installed. And I started by removing pieces of the flooring from a few different boxes, mixing them up so that there wouldn't be any obvious color differences from the different boxes. And this particular flooring, which is a three quarter inch solid oak hardwood from Armstrong Flooring, has a pretty randomized color that they call Prime Sable, so this wasn't really a huge necessity for me. 
And I've actually had this particular flooring since before we moved into this house, as I was planning to finish our attic in our old house. So this flooring has been sitting in this room for about eight months now. That being said, if you've purchased new flooring, you'll want to give it a few weeks to acclimate to the environment. It's also a really good idea to go ahead and remove the flooring from its boxes during that time, as that'll speed up the acclimation process. So I actually own a Wagner Orion 950 moisture meter, so I went ahead and checked a few pieces of the flooring just to confirm its moisture level was good. And the pieces I checked were at or below the equilibrium moisture content of the room, meaning that they were well acclimated to the environment. Finally, after all of this work, it was time to get the first row installed. So I started by marking a point half inch from each end of the wall and snapping a chalk line. And that half inch gap will allow the wood flooring to expand and contract seasonally without being constrained. And the reason I snapped a chalk line rather than just using a half inch spacer is because most walls are not perfectly straight. So it's a good idea to do this unless you are absolutely sure your wall is straight. Case in point, while my line was half an inch from the wall at each end, it ended up about three quarters of an inch from the wall towards the center of the room. So with the reference line in place, I could start laying out my first row, and that's where I ran into a bit of trouble. What's that? Are you serious right now? All right, so things were going pretty smoothly, and then I ran into a pretty big roadblock when I went to lay that first piece of flooring. So I kind of rushed through the process of getting the subfloor prepped and made the mistake of not checking with a level to see if there were any major low spots or high spots, and that came back to bite me. So when I went to lay that first piece of hardwood, I found an almost half an inch dip along this wall of the room. Basically the joist that's closest to this wall is high by about half an inch, and so I need to do something to shim that up because hardwood flooring can flex about an eighth of an inch and it's not a major deal, but that much of a flex would cause a lot of issues in the future. So uh, I looked around online and it seems like some people are using asphalt shingles as shims. And I know felt paper is a pretty good choice as well, but the nice thing about shingles is they're a little bit thicker. I can stack them up three or four tall and they'll stay in place because they're nice and rough and they're super dense so they won't compress when people stand on it and they're also pretty cheap and readily available. So they make a really good shim material and I think this should work pretty well. So with the shingles in place, I could finally get to installing the first row and I used my chalk line as my reference point and face nailed the first board in place using a cordless finish nailer. And if you don't have a powered nailer, you could just use a hammer to drive in finish nails, but you'd want to pre-drill the holes to avoid splitting the flooring. I repeated the process for the second board in the first row, also nailing through the edge of the tongue to secure the board to the subfloor from both edges. By the way, I figured that I should mention that the pile of electronics I'm working around here is our home internet, and unfortunately I couldn't just kill our internet for a few days, so I had to work around this mess during the entire install process. Anyway, I repeated the process for the third board in the row, and then I could install the final board, and I needed to cut the board to length to fit, and the way I like to mark the length on these boards is to use a spacer against the wall, a scrap piece of half inch plywood in this case, flip the board around 180 degrees, then mark where the face of the previous board meets up with the board I needed to cut. And this marks the exact location without having to do any actual measuring, and I find it's much faster and less accident prone than measuring with a tape measure. To make the cut, I used a miter saw, although a circular saw or even a jigsaw would probably work fine here, these cuts don't really need to be insanely precise as they'll be covered by the trim anyway. So after cutting the board to length, I can nail it down and finish the first row. And I did go back and use a nail set to set any nails that didn't drive in fully, especially in the tongue, since the next row would need to match up tightly against that first row. So to start the next row, I used one of the shorter pieces of hardwood as you want to stagger the seams when installing hardwood flooring, both for aesthetics as well as strength. And I used a flooring mallet to make sure the plank was nice and tight against the first row. With the plank in place, I could finally pull out the real star of this show, the pneumatic flooring stapler. So this beauty drives two inch staples through the tongue of the flooring, securing it tightly to the subfloor. To actuate the stapler, you hit it with this mallet that's included with the stapler, and that force from hitting the stapler also helps to close up any gaps between the planks. I added staples every six to eight inches and also made sure to stay clear of the ends of the planks to avoid splitting the tongue. And from there, it was really just rinse and repeat, but I'd also like to point out this flooring mallet before moving on. The metal end of the mallet has this wedge shape, which prevents it from damaging the face of the pre-finished flooring, like the flooring I'm installing. 
and you'll likely need to tap the flooring into place due to the subfloor being uneven or the flooring itself being bowed or both, and this mallet will be your best friend during installation. Also, get ready to have a monster blister from hitting this mallet thousands of times over the course of your installation. Anyway, as I said, from there it was really just rinse and repeat until I got to the doorway. So let's take a second to talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Zorro.com. So you can purchase pretty much all of the tools I used in this video, including the DeWalt flooring stapler, miter saw, and cordless finish nailer, the roll air compressor, and the saw stop job site table saw you'll see me use later, all from Zorro.com. Zorro.com carries thousands of brands and millions of products at everyday low prices and has fast and free shipping with no hassle returns and excellent customer service. So if you're looking to purchase tools for your next home improvement project, go to www.zorro.com crafted and sign up for their Zmail to receive 15% off your first order. So as a Zmail subscriber, you'll receive exclusive promotions and discounts, seasonal savings, as well as product guides and how-to articles. Thanks again to Zorro.com for sponsoring this week's video, and let's get back to the project. After getting the flooring installed up to the doorway, I could start working on the transition. And I wanted a flush transition rather than having to use T-molding, as I'll be installing the same flooring in this adjoining hallway in the future. So the first step was to undercut the door jam to allow the flooring to run below it, and I like to use a pull saw to do this. I used an offcut of the flooring as my spacer, and just made sure the saw was flush with the flooring as I cut through the jam. And I actually find this method to be just as quick as an oscillating tool, and it's much quieter. Once the jam was undercut, I could slide the piece of flooring I was going to use as the transition into place. And as you can see, this will result in not only a perfectly flush transition, but in my opinion, a great looking transition. So I temporarily placed the transition piece and then fastened the first board in the next row to act as a hard stop for one end of the transition. And once that board was fastened, I could square up the transition strip, making sure it was also even across the doorway. And I used a large square for this as I really wanted a nice tight install here. Once I had the transition strip where I wanted it, I nailed it into place through the tongue. And I didn't use the flooring stapler here as I was worried it would move the board around too much, but I'll probably go back and add some more staples now that the rest of the rows are in place. With the transition strip in place, I could get back to adding rows, which was once again more of the same. One thing I really liked about this particular flooring was the random links it came in. And this made it really easy to practically eliminate waste, as I could usually find a piece that fit almost perfectly at the end of each row. It also made staggering the seams between the planks simple, and I could also avoid H joints very easily. Now if your flooring comes in standard lengths, you'll want to focus more on avoiding these types of joints. H joints happen when you install row after row of flooring with the seams lining up in every other row. And this is not only aesthetically kind of off, it also impacts the integrity of the flooring. Stair stepping is another thing you should generally avoid and it is more of an aesthetic thing, but in my opinion, flooring should be installed with no real discernible pattern where possible as it's just less distracting visually. Anyway, I kept installing flooring until I got to the area where I'd been storing the hardwood during the install and had to take a break to move the hardwood, remove the carpet and trim and add the vapor barrier to that area before moving on. Once that was done, I just continued adding rows and eventually, when I got to the fourth row from the wall, I started to run into the wall with the mallet when hitting the stapler. After installing that row, I had to switch back to using my finish nailer instead, which still went fairly quickly. The one issue with using the finish nailer here rather than the flooring stapler though was that I was having a really hard time closing up the gaps between the planks entirely. And there's evidently a tool for this called a flooring jack, but I was unfortunately unaware of this tool at the time, and I can definitely see where one of these tools, which just kind of pushes between the wall and the flooring, would come in real handy, and I plan to pick one up before installing the flooring in my hallway. Anyway, once I got to the very last row, I needed to cut the planks to width to have the correct expansion gap between the boards and the wall. And I went ahead and laid out the pieces for the entire row and then numbered each piece, also writing the width I needed to cut each board to on the backs of the planks. And the gap between the second to last row and the wall varied about half an inch between each end, so I did need to cut the boards to different widths. Also, as you might be able to see, I had set aside boards with damaged tongues during the rest of the install, just for use on this last row, as I knew I would most likely need to rip the last row to width anyway. Now luckily for my install, I ended up with almost a full row for my last row, but if your last row is extremely narrow, less than one inch, you might need to glue it to the previous row depending on your manufacturer's instructions. 
Anyway, I ripped all the boards to width of the table saw, adjusting the fence based on the measurement I had written on the back of the boards. And if you don't have a table saw, you could definitely use a circular saw or jigsaw to make this cut. To install that last row, I used a pry bar to help get the board set in place before face nailing it. And I cannot find my flooring pull bar, which I've used in previous flooring installs, but that would have certainly come in handy here as well. I made sure to get the flooring as tight as I could, and honestly, I still ended up with some small gaps, but nothing major. So with that, the flooring was pretty much finished, so all that was left to do was reinstall the trim. And I started with the 1x4 door casing and needed to first remove the hinges and strike plate from the door, as well as scrape off any residual caulk. And I went over the process of installing door casing during my shop build series, and I'll link to that video if you want more details, but the basic process is to cut the vertical casing pieces a quarter of an inch longer than the distance between the door jamb and the floor. And this will result in a quarter inch reveal for the horizontal casing piece. After cutting the vertical pieces to length, I tacked them in place with just one nail so that I could still make adjustments, and then cut the horizontal piece to length based on the distance between the vertical pieces. Once I verified the fit, I nailed it in place using shims where necessary so that the pieces matched up nicely. I then added more nails to the vertical pieces, making sure I had an even quarter inch reveal around the entire door. And I repeated the process for this small door, which leads to our crawl space, and I needed to rip down one of the vertical pieces to fit the space. Also, I'm using finish nails here and nailing into the framing around the door, but I came back with a brad nailer and nailed the casing to the jam as well. With the door casing installed, I could work on installing the 1x6 baseboards. And I marked my stud locations to make sure I was nailing into the studs, and I used 2 inch finish nails to attach the baseboards. You might also notice a small gap between the end of the flooring and the baseboard, and that is because the 1x6 boards I bought were actually only 5 eighths of an inch thick, rather than the 3 quarters of an inch that I was expecting. And I actually had to come back and shim the baseboards in a few spots to cover this up, which was definitely frustrating. It's nothing a little caulk won't cover up, but just annoying that I had to do that. I just continued installing the baseboards around the rest of the room, leaving the wall where I'd be installing the Murphy beds and other cabinetry without trim since I'd have to remove them anyway. The last thing to do once the baseboards were in was to fill any visible nail holes in the flooring with matching acrylic filler. And this filler is made by the same manufacturer as the flooring and is colored to match the flooring. So with the nail holes filled, I could call this flooring installation finished. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I love the way this oak flooring turned out. It is gorgeous, so much better than the carpet that was in here before. Obviously there's still some work to be done with caulking and painting, but already the space is looking so much better. So if you guys aren't already, go ahead and get subscribed and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss the future projects in this room. If you wanna tackle a project like this yourself, check out the links to the tools and materials I use in this video in the video description below. Again, big thanks to Azora.com for providing some of the tools on this video. And I guess that about does it. So thanks again for watching everybody and until next week, happy building.